akin to the Hindu trinity of Brahm, Shiv and Vishnu. That trinity, according to Christendom, is considered to be a myth. And on that basis, I would also conclude that the trinity in Christianity is also a myth. Well, what happens to our Hindu brethren who claim that the Creator came down in various manifestations, including animal form? What happens there? Hey guys, I'm back and uh, I want to start off and just ask if you liked the video, please uh, remember to subscribe to the channel. Please also like and comment. Uh, I'm usually uh, used to grading students, so you're welcome to grade me in the comment section as well. So in the previous video, I looked at the common assumption when people decry the doctrine of the Trinity. And I also looked at how Christians construct the understanding of the one and the three when we look at the doctrine of the Trinity. And uh, in this clip, I now want to look at Shabir's accusation that the Trinity is a Hindu construct. He speaks of the Trimurti. And let me just say to you that in a previous video I did on my channel, I looked at in great detail at Dr. Swaps Shayet's Parallelomania concerning the Hindu Trinity and the Christian Trinity. So you're welcome to look at that. And also why all these ideas to say that what polytheists and early Greek mythology and um, even Egyptian and various types of mythologies constructed when they looked at the doctrine of the Trinity is very succinct with what we see in the Christian Trinity is just not true. So you're welcome to check that out as well. In the end of the video, there'll be a little card and I will make sure to post that video for you. I'm usually curious about why some critics might think the doctrine of the Trinity is not succinct and why they would relate it to something like the Trimurti. Now you might ask, Pastor, but what is parallelomania? And let me just say that it is simply the belief that any similarity in a narrative or set of beliefs is a direct parallel when afforded to another system of beliefs. An example of this would be, for instance, to think or to insist that the concept of Allah and the moon god of the ancients are the same, or even that what we speak about when we look at Yahweh of the Old Testament and Allah are succinct. But this is simply not true. And those that demand that these things are the same and these concepts are succinct, they need to prove its validity. Now, let me just say that this is something that is not new. Uh, in the 17th century, late 17th century in actual fact, an exciting diary was written when a missionary by the name of J. Lockman traveled to India uh, and he sheds a bit of light in, in a book titled Travels of a Jesuit into Various Parts of the World where he relates an exciting story where some people, some missionaries uh, in actual fact spoke to him and they told him that there were some Trinitarian comparisons that could be used to speak to Hindus. And after he reflected on some of these assumed parallels, he writes the following in his journal. With respect to these three beings of the Trimurti, I've met with some European missionaries who pretended that the heathens have some idea of the mystery of the Trinity and say that it is expressly declared in their book that they are three persons in one God. I myself have frequently discoursed with the Brahmins on the subject, but they expressed themselves so confusedly that I never could understand the meaning of what they say perfectly. So, Lockman concludes, and he speaks quite clearly, that these concepts which was assumed to be succinct with a triune concept of Christianity, when they speak of their divinities, is not the same. Uh, he even goes as far as to say, some Hindus portray the three divinities as individual deities, while others hold that they are really but one and the same God, considered in three respects, as creator, preserver, and destroyer of things. But Trinity is nowhere to be found, since they did not observe anything of three distinct persons in one sole God. Now, this is one of the earliest mentions of this understanding of the Trimurti and its succinctness with that which we found in the doctrine of the Trinity. Now, Lockman shows quite clearly that some of these assumed discoveries about the Trinity is simply over-enthusiastic. He says the following. He says, some Hindus portray the three divinities as individual deities, while others hold that they are really but one and the same God, considered in the three respects as creator, preserver, and destroyer of things. 
but Trinity is nowhere to be found since they did not observe anything of the three distinct persons in one soul, God. A more recent critical scholar, Annie Besant, sharply denies that the idea of the Trimurti and Trinity is the same concept at all. She writes the following, The three deities are material, imperfect, and even sinful, far from the mystery of the God who knows himself as the Son knows the Father, and loves himself as the Spirit, the love of Father, and the Son shows himself. The Trinitarian notion of person having to do with a rational individuum, a being endowed with reason and free will, is distant from the Indian mystic mask of the divine. Missionary to Muslims, Kofri Piranda, writes the following, As with other religions, the threefold doctrine is best understood in its historical context, however attractive seeming cultural parallels might be. Another scholar, Ernest Hull, writes the following, Christians and Hindus do not even think of their deities the same way. For the Christian, the Trinity is a deep mystery of faith, while Hindus see a multiplicities, even of deities, as the delusions of Maya. Friends, let me say that there is nothing in the definition or articulation of the Hindu conception of gods that leads us to believe that the Hindu Trimurti is like the Christian Trinity. Friends, to be honest with you, if I listen to Shabir's understanding of this doctrine and the way he treats it, it leads me to a place where I say and ask myself if he's truly sincere to define it reasonably as Christians would attempt to do. He also mentions that, well, there is a seeming form that is illogical, irrational, unreasonable when Christians demand that God is coming down in human form. Well, we need to ask the question first of all, why is the Creator coming down in human form? Well, it is not illogical or irrational or unreasonable for Christians. And to be fair, obviously in his short video, he could not get into the full understanding as to why he believes it to be illogical, irrational and unreasonable. But let me just say that there's nowhere in the Bible that it does not forbade God to come down. Uh, and it is instead encouraged. Uh, one of my favorite early Christian sermons is by a Christian by the name of Eusebius of Caesarea. And Eusebius preached a, a sermon uh, that was actually titled Demonstratio Evangelica in Book 6, Chapter 1 to 25, where he beautifully depicts the anticipation of the Old Testament, looking towards the New Testament uh, and witnessing the fulfillment and the promise that God will one day dwell physically with his people. This is what was realized and ultimately what is fulfilled in the biblical expectation. So when Shabir says, yes, is this a one-time event? Well, it is a one-time event for Christians. And if this one-time event is true and adequate, and if it is a true revelation and articulation of God coming to his people, one time is then enough. And that is precisely what the Christians claim about the incarnation of Christ. And there is no additional revelation after Christ necessary, nor another prophet that should speak for God. Because in Christ, Christians find the ultimate fulfillment eschatologically of this promised Messiah, who was also Lord and God. So, uh, I hope you enjoyed this video. Well, in closing, thank you so much for listening. And remember to share this video and remember to subscribe. I hope you have a lovely day and I hope to speak with you again soon. Be blessed.